Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba will be joined by Andrea Adesso, who is uh, one of the marketing leaders, brand, uh, vice president, brand strategy, hack and second meridian health in just a second. Mary, can I do this? I've been showing this new t-shirt that is the new official stand and deliver lessons in leadership shirt. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm really Metro excited Graphics. about it. Thank you to Andy Duke, the uh, president and owner of Metro Graphics for this. Cool. Really cool. It's one thing to look at it like this, Mary. But I found a professional model <laughs> who was going to show it off. And I did not want to. I thought it was going to be you. Oh, this is even more exciting. Yeah, but I didn't want to have the gun show so soon. I thought people wouldn't be ready for it. So I decided to have a younger version of the gun show. Scarlett, can you come our camera expert operator? Okay. This <laughs> is what the shirt should look like. Come on. Take note, get down here. <laughs> Did you give him an of... extra small so he could like look at this? <laughs> look. How... We have hit rock bottom. Look at oh look, there's nothing on get out of here. There's nothing on the back. <laughs> oh my gosh, what is wrong with you people? Oh my god. We gosh. have completely hit rock bottom on oh. lessons and leadership. Oh, I apologize. We're on the air right now. You know that, right? Frank. Oh, oh man. Hold on. Our two senior professional production experts are shaking their head. Alvin and Frank, what was wrong with that? It was kind of shameless. I mean, but I mean, it's a nice shirt. And looks so? like it's made. Looks like it's made well. Um, I'll uh, I'll be expecting mine in the mail. Cod and uh, no, no. Oh no, you, you're covering well, the. No, not see. Well, Mary is literally sending it out today to Elvin and Frank. How am I going to do that? You have it in Montclair. I live in Westfield, so that, my sir, is oh, a lie. Shirts. <laughs> Frank, well, I don't think we'll ever get our me shirts. getting Frank. it to you. <laughs> I will get them, but it's not going out today. Is my point. I apologize, but how how good the scar and look in that? Oh no, he looks no good. Comment. I, I, no comment. No yeah. comment. All right, let's bring in Andrea, who has no idea any of this just happened. <laughs> Andrea, you're not going to want to see what happened before you get on here. Um, now, speaking of, hey, listen, you're the brand expert. We were just promoting our new, how cool is this? Uh, that's very nicely done. Okay. And and you know branding better than most. This is Andrea Desso, Vice President of Brand Strategy with our partners over at Hackensack Meridian Health. How you doing, Andrea? Doing well. How about you, Steve? I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. Uh, real quick on this. You and I were talking offline a while back, and we were talking about leadership communication issues, which we talk about a lot. Do. Your approach to leadership, influenced, again, by Jim Blazer, who has been a mentor of yours, a leader at HMH. Yes. But who and what else has influenced your approach to leadership? Mm. I've had many mentors over my over my years. Um, and some of them have been both within the organization I've worked for, as well as outside of the organization I've worked for. And I think that that, that is critical, right? It's getting those perspectives for me from those people who are outside, even of your industry sometime, that have become life lessons that I've taken with me along the route. Mm, and that includes some family members whom I know. <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I often will go to my father for his wise words of wisdom. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and before Mary jumps in here, the one thing is that, that struck me, has always struck me about you, that strikes me about you, is your confidence. You exude confidence because? <laughs> because? Because I've had leaders who've believed in me, who have told me that I deserve to be in the role that I'm in or in the in the seat that I'm sitting in. Do you, so it's others telling you you should have confidence? I, you know what? I, I have the confidence in myself that I that I feel I can do the job that I was hired to do, right? But I think it's only natural for I think it's only natural. Um, so every now and then, doubt yourself a little bit. Am I doing the right <laughs> thing, right? Am I doing the right thing for the business? Am I doing the right thing personally, right? And that's where I will look to my team members or, you know, a mentor, a leader, someone to tell me and be my my kind of gut check, right? And that, whether the answer is yes, you're doing the right thing or you're not, either answer still gives me the confidence to move forward. Well said, Mary, go ahead. 
Yeah. And I, I've just been fascinated about branding, especially throughout a pandemic, hard enough for anybody, right? Like Steve and I were just joking with a t-shirt, that's all good and well, but we all had to continue moving that ball down the field, but branding in healthcare yeah. during a pandemic, how has that changed? And what does the future look like based on the lessons you've learned from that? Uh, great question, Mary. I, listen, I, I'll break it down. For me, branding is three things. Um, on a professional basis, I should say too, right? We all have a, a personal brand and we can get into sure. that after this perhaps. But um, it, during the pandemic was an interesting time for us at Hackensack Meridian Health, obviously being in the healthcare space. Um, we sit in a crowded market when it comes to healthcare. There are healthcare options almost at every corner nowadays. And so even prior to the pandemic hitting, we already were in a space where we had to tell ourselves and look internally and say, how are we going to differentiate ourselves, right? right. And really connect back to, to the consumers and, and the patients who we serve, the communities we serve. And so prior to the pandemic, back in February of 2022, we were ready and rare to go, ready to launch a brand new advertising campaign that was going to be the latest and greatest um, thing that HMH was going to put out. And then a couple of weeks later, all of those plans were were set aside for our brand, um, but it didn't change the voice that we wanted to convey and the intention that we wanted to convey to consumers at the time, right? So while the traditional advertising campaign and the media plan that we had mm -hmm. to launch that brand shifted and the dialogue had to shift a little bit, the intention and what we were rooted in remained the same. Hold on, Andrew, is that 2020 or 20? Did you say 20? It was February of what? February of 2020. Yeah. Okay. And then the world changed. And uh, then the world changed just a few a few weeks later. Yeah. So, so here's what's interesting to me about this. As a leader who's on the younger side of things, you also have to lead, manage, and 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 work with, but frankly, lead a team of people who are generally older than you. That is true. Unique challenge? It is a unique challenge. Um, what I will say is I think we can bring, and my team is great at this, we all bring our own perspectives to the table, right? I, I think I've reached a point with my current team that, you know, we, there's a mutual respect for everything that we have all learned along the way in what we're doing. Um, and we bring those strengths to, to the table together. Um, but certainly uh, my age surprises some when I'm sitting in, in a room for the first time with some individuals, perhaps. <laughs> yes, it, it might be surprising. I think that's where the confidence has to come into play, though. Real quick, before Mary jumps back in, we talked about Jim Blazer before, who's I've learned so much from as well. Um, one of the leaders, one of the top leaders at HMH, along with Bob Garrett and uh, the CEO and others. Biggest leadership lesson you've learned from Jim Blazer is? Ah, yes. I've learned quite a few from him. One of my favorite things that he does, so it is not enough to be seen. You need to be heard. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat at a conference room table with many people around it, and we're discussing a topic, the floor opens up for commentary, and then the inevitable inevitable happens, right? The unspoken pecking order of feedback. <laughs> um, who is going to go first? Who's going to, and it always ends up being the kind of highest to lowest in rank order, if you will, right? And, and that's supposed to be the pecking order. And Jim has always, always since the day I've met him, had the approach of letting everybody else in the room speak first, and then he will provide his feedback because that's how important the um, the perspectives of, of his team members are um, to him. So I, I try to take that same approach. That's a big one. Mary, go ahead. Got a minute left. Yeah, definitely. And I don't know if we can get in and out of this in a minute, but you are a young leader, but you are also a woman leader. And I would just love for you to share a message to any other young women who are watching right now, who maybe are in college and grad school and say, hey, you want to know what? If she can do it, so can I. What message do you have for other women leaders out there? Absolutely. So one thing I will say is um, I'm a millennial. 
Okay, I'll be it on the cusp. You're um, kidding me too. <laughs> <laughs> not that funny. Okay, they didn't even have funny. names for us of what we were <laughs> dinosaurs. Edit <Don't have> <laughs> that sometimes, out. Sometimes, sometimes I I don't want to admit that I'm a millennial, but um, and, and what I would say to millennials and younger is get rid of this kind of instant gratification and recognition expectation, right? Success happens over time. It's just, it's going to take time. This is not an overnight thing. And there is no fast pass. There's no golden ticket to that corner office. So take your time and really hone your skills and learn from others who are, who wow. are in your thoughts. Wow. That's a good one. Thanks. I- be be, pay, be ambitious and patient at the be same ambitious. time. Yes, exactly. Yes. I think you have it right. That's Andrea Desso, Vice President of Brand Strategy, HMA, Chack and Sack Meridian Health, our longtime partners. Thank you, Andrea. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Mary and I will be back right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This is Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Mary, you're about to throw to an interview with Dr. David Bader, who is a distinguished professor and director of the Institute for Data Science at NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. What's the topic? Oh, it is all about AI, artificial intelligence. I don't know about you. I've actually used it recently. <laughs> um, it's amazing. Well, the the whole the whole chat where you you know the chat APT, whatever it's called. I I always have the boys. Chat G P T. <laughs> chat W X Y Z. This is why I have my boys log me into it. But I had to come up with a mission statement the other day, and you can literally just put in like you know, it's like saying like, Hey Siri, give me a mission statement. She'll probably hear me on my phone. It's for your but dog rescue. It is, and it gave me the most amazing mission statement ever. It was unbelievable. So it's great. So we're gonna hear from Dr. Bader, what he believes AI is going to do, not only just in life, but in, in the workforce, right? In the impact it's going to have on our um, elections, right? So it it's terrifying, but also if used well, I think it's going to be exciting. Uh, yeah. And then on the back end, Mary and I are going to have a little conversation about artificial intelligence and leadership. This is Dr. David Bader, Lessons in Leadership. All right, folks, everything you wanted, needed to know, didn't know where to ask about AI, artificial intelligence, Dr. David Bader, distinguished professor and director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology, one of our higher ed partners. Doctor, good to see you. Good to see you too, Steve. I'd love to talk about AI. Good, 30 seconds or less, what the heck is it? AI is a fantastic tool that can learn a lot from data and then be able to help us um, by using that data to improve our lives. Okay, got it. You got a bunch of people around here in our production team freaking out, asking the question, am I going to lose my job to AI? Well, how do you, how do you think... talk to those folks? Including, by the way, I'm worried about myself too. Go ahead. <laughs> You're not replaceable, Steve. So you have nothing to worry about. Go but ahead. AI certainly is going to change the, the workforce. Many of the introductory level jobs that we have are um, where we can learn and repeat that process, maybe AI will assist those folks. We already see that happening in a number of sectors from driving cars to riding and um, places where, where it is really a repeatable task. But uh, otherwise, uh, I think in much of the workforce, AI will be an assistive technology. AI is going to help us write better. It's going to help us reason better. And it's really exciting to be able to use that in day-to-day -day practice. You know, Doctor, I appreciate everything you're saying, but there are some involved in the AI, uh, the business of AI, who have said publicly in testimony before Congress, there'll be a whole range of hearings as we move forward because Congress and government's trying to figure out their role in all this. 
there are those in the AI industry or people involved in AI who say, you know what, um, we're worried, we're concerned about the parameters of AI, the limits of AI, the regulation of AI, and frankly, the potential dangers. Please talk about it. That's a, a fantastic um, conversation to have. And I think because AI is being developed at such an accelerated pace, we've seen changes in the last six months that we haven't seen in the course of humanity, that there is some concern to think about it and to make sure that it's regulated properly. And I think those discussions will take place that may be for the next year or two years where we figure out how do we have more responsible AI? How is it used correctly? How does society as a whole talk about AI and accept its uses? So it is a conversation that, that's very important, but I'm optimistic that those will be areas that will be worked out in full order. Now, finish your point, I'm sorry, because I'm about to ask you about elections and misinformation, so go ahead. So uh, with, with AI, again, it was just six months ago that ChatGPT dropped and had over 100 million users in it, its first month testing out this new generative AI. And so that conversation is just starting around the country and around the world as to how we want to use the, these new tools that we have. Of course, like anything that's new, we have to figure out what are the boundaries on it? How can we use this in a responsible fashion? What, is, what do we have to understand about the risks, whether it's used in a courtroom, whether it's used in medicine, whether it's used in education? So we have to understand those things. And like any new technology, time will help work out those details. So, so let me lay this out for you, and I need, I need your um, reaction to it. So the graphic will come up on the screen right now for a series we've been doing for years called Democracy at a Crossroads, for a lot of reasons. But now let's talk about elections, information, credible, legitimate information to voters before they vote, and AI. If AI, if artificial intelligence has the ability to have Joe Biden or Donald Trump or anyone else running for major office, to, to, to not have actually use a quote from them directly, but put a 30 second spot together on, 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 on broadcast and a whole range of social media, digital platforms in which it manufactures what that person said or did and puts it out as information for voters to decide before they vote, but it's false. It's been manufactured through AI, it's misinformation. How the heck do we manage that? That is a real threat, and I agree with you. That's one of the biggest concerns that we have with upholding our democracy and understanding information and disinformation. There are many bad actors out there who are working on that right now. That, that's happened in the past, and I think AI enables that to happen at an even greater rate going into the future. So we have to combat that. I think that takes some work in cybersecurity, for instance, what we do at New Jersey Institute of Technology and the great universities around the state of New Jersey are working on ways to detect, to combat it, to combat it, and also to prevent that type of disinformation mm -hmm. from spreading. So humans naturally believe video in ways that is more natural than say printed text. And so when you see a video, it's very natural to believe that, that it's real. And this generative AI, as you mentioned, can generate real voices, real imagery that is nearly impossible to detect from the original. But since it's generated, we do have algorithms that are able to mm. understand that, that it is a fabricated image and to be able to detect and, and flag them. But it's gonna take a lot of hard work. Both yeah. sides are going to escalate and we'll have to get better and better at preventing that disinformation. Let me ask you this because a lot of what you're saying leads me to this question. I'm a student of leadership. We do a sister program uh, with my colleague, Mary Gamble called Lessons in Leadership. And I've been researching, thinking about, and have to write about in the near future, the subject of artificial intelligence and leadership, meaning what does AI mean for the leaders of today and tomorrow? What do you believe it means 
to those of us in leadership positions, particularly those of us who want to be better at this leadership game? AI offers this fantastic ability to learn what information is important. For instance, to understand best practices, to understand areas that we may not have had expert expertise in previously. So as a leader, we may want to understand a current issue or particular topic. And I think that's where AI really shines, to be able to help inform, to be able to help provide information in a way that's targeted, not to the masses, but to target you individually to a way that you like to get that information as well. So AI really has the ability to impact individuals to be personalized and to really give you a capability of understanding to augment your memory, to augment your knowledge in ways that haven't been seen before. So I'm very optimistic with leadership. We'll see benefits to having AI all around us in all of the actions that we take um, to understand policies, to understand impacts of decisions, and, and so on. This is uh, the first of many conversations we're going to have about artificial intelligence. One of those conversations will also be about AI and income disparities and the fact that different people have different access to technology in certain forms. Dr. David Bader, distinguished professor and director of the Institute for Data Science at NJIT, one of our higher ed partners. Uh, Dr. Bader, thank you so much for joining us. Great to talk with you, Steve. So there you have it, artificial intelligence. So Mary, let me ask you this. Uh, there's artificial intelligence, and then there's emotional intelligence. So here's the thing. Uh, one of my favorite books, Dr. Daniel Goleman, talk a lot about uh, emotional intelligence and uh, leadership. Artificial intelligence and leadership. So Mary, if you, you said earlier before we introduced the Dr. Bader segment that you searched for a mission statement for your future mm -hmm. animal rescue yeah. thing you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. But you make it sound as if you don't need us, we don't need our brains to think about a mission statement. You just go online and find one and then adapt it accordingly. So what the heck are we doing here? Why do you need us to have these conversations about leadership? Why can't you use AI, artificial intelligence, to come up with the best solution to every leadership problem and you don't need us using our brains? Well, I'll tell you something. It is the collective brains and that's what's really cool. Once you really start digging into what AI is, it is taking a collective, it's almost like a think tank, right? I know we have Steve, you know, think tank with Steve Adubato, which is our sister series, but you're taking all of the opinions, all of the best information, all of the research that's been done on all of these things, and you're automating it. And it's not to say that you're going to take it and use it exactly. You're then going to adapt it as your own. So instead of having, we were just talking before we went into the segment about that we're going in our 30th anniversary, right, of our uh, sister series and the Caucus Educational Corporation. And, Established in 1994. Go ahead. Correct. And sure, we're going to have a conversation with our internal team. We'll probably pull in some of our board members, which is all good and great. But imagine if you could then just type in, I'm hosting a 30th anniversary of a, you know, a nonprofit. Give me a press release. It spits out a press release, which is better than you can pay anybody at any PR agency. It, I don't it, know but if then, I'm well, have you tried it? No. Exactly. And, I, like, and I, I, don't, I don't like fish, but I've never tried it. Exactly. Well, it's, I don't like fish either. Anything that smells like that, I'm not eating it. So you and I could not be more. Okay, <laughs> but the, why do I have to try? It? Hold on. Well, no, no, no. But you try it, then you adapt it. I'm not saying that you would use it, say, not... you know, for exams, right? Or for papers or yeah, even. That's, in the... that's it... risky. Then where, where's the brain power? The brain power comes in that you are then, again, going back to what I said, if you just have a few key words, right? that you want to come up with an organic pasta that also helps you lose weight. Talk you know, about you... leadership and not pasta. No, but I'm saying it's the same idea. If you have a problem it... on your team, it is. Say if we had AI 10 years ago, I have a challenge with someone on my team every time that yes. I give them feedback. And for fun, we're going to, I swear, I'm going to schedule a Zoom meeting with you. Giving just feedback to a resistant team member. Giving feedback to a it. resistant team member, what would you say to them? It literally gives you the best information that it has, and it's constantly learning and evolving, right? 
with, with no bias and it's learning and evolving, not just one type, right? Not just like you, you know, the Daniel Goleman, they don't just use Richard Carlson. They don't use Dale Carnegie. They don't use, you know, Tony Robbins. It's taking the collective we and that brain power and harnessing it in a way that we've never seen before. And that's how I think it could be used for leadership for the good. If you're having a challenge with somebody, you no longer have to like read a book. You could just type in your challenge and it gives you some information. Mm, it's an Italian thing. Mm, <laughs> I have a hard time what you're saying. Alvin, do me a favor. Alvin Badger, our director. I know you don't want to come in right now, but come in, please. If you listen to this conversation about artificial intelligence, here's my devil's advocate question. So if artificial intelligence, and I'm not against it, I just don't get how people are saying it can replace this, that then why do we need Elvin Badger? Whoa, whoa. No, no, hold on. Now, you can, you know, easy, hold on. Easy. now you're interested? I'm now you care about it? No, but here's the thing. If we put in, in the AI machine, whatever it is, oh, what's the best way to have our show directed? Elvin has creativity, experience, nuance, <laughs> insight, all that, and it makes him the unique director he is. AI can't replace an Elvin nope. bad. It cannot. No, nope, but it can it can write the heck out of a mission statement, press releases, and you know connected and to leadership, though, Mary, it can't replace human beings. You cannot replace human beings, but sometimes we all need somebody to turn to to get some ideas, advice of breaking through or getting buy-in. And you know, we've had on a previous segment, Rev Reverend Sori is talking about how he develops his sermons, right? When he was talking about every week he has to develop a sermon. I'm not saying he would use that to write it, but if he's stuck and he has a thought i went fishing today and this fish taught me a leadership lesson how could i turn it into a sermon uh, it feels cookie cutter no it but then you take it and you adapt it that's all i'm okay. saying so one second i had elvin come on not just because he's good looking uh, elvin yes sir ai and leadership slash the world of directing go ahead i wouldn't use ai with leadership you don't want to have you not I, i'm sorry to go off topic but have you not seen the terminator like let's <laughs> let's well, hold on. No, I have to let's not do this. What we're talking about. Everything. What's that have to do with what we're talking about? Everything. We can't give computers too much control. We can't. Because let me explain some. Let me I'm gonna tell you a quick story real quick. And Frank could attest to this. So right now, they're trying to get rid of camera operators, replace them with robotic cameras, audio engineers, because now they're trying to, you know, um, do the audio with computers instead of actual audio engineers. And it's not, it works a little bit, but it doesn't work the way as a human being would work. To your point, Frank Brown, the brilliant audio engineer, Scarlin, who we saw at the beginning of the show, who is handling our operations behind the camera, you as our director. I don't want computers doing that. I'm sorry, Mary. I agree too, but I'm not talking about those physical things. Okay. I'm talking about leaders can use them to help them to make better right. leadership decisions. That's all. The AI and leadership discussion will continue Continues. unless it's the leadership in the future. Elvin, what are you looking up at the sky for? Because so, I have another screen here. But what I, I was going to say, Mary, but what if leaders are using the AI to do everything for them? Are they really, really leading or is the AI leading? But only this is for a future edition. Oh my gosh. All right. We have to say goodbye, but this will be a the, whole other edition. We promise Dora's you. Box has been open to AI and the leadership <laughs> connection, lessons in leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, and what appears to be Elvin Badger, but it may be a computer simulation of him. I'm not sure. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank. The International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. The North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world. Choose New Jersey and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIA NJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth.